Hello everyone, and welcome to the 44th episode of Tech Life Skills with Tanmay. My name is Tanmay Bakshi, and for the past couple of weeks, I have been taking a deep dive into the world of music. Now, specifically, I'm very interested in the intersection of music and technology. And earlier this month, I revealed a brand new project of mine where I'm trying to use machine learning technology to augment songwriters by providing them automated inspiration at scale, right? So being able to automatically create, you know, say thousands of verses and allow songwriters to use that uh, to, to help them do their job more efficiently, more effectively, you know, give them that inspiration, remove writer's block. And on the journey of building said bot, I have been working with a multitude of very talented musicians and others in the music industry. Now, two of these individuals were, first of all, very helpful to me, for which I'm very grateful. Uh, and they also stood out to me as people who really want to make a difference in the world, and particularly in the music industry, using the power of technology. Now, they have pioneered a brand new way of educating students in music and also allowing them to take accredited examinations at their own convenience entirely online. Their names are Cliff Cooper, founder and CEO of Online Music Exams, and Alicia Leons, the uh, founding member of, uh, of Online Music Exams. Now they have incredibly impressive backgrounds, so I'm not going to attempt to introduce them myself. Instead, I think it would be great to hear from them directly. And so, without any further ado, let's welcome Cliff and Alicia to the show. All right. Hi, Cliff. Hi, Alicia. How are you? Hi. Good, thank Hi. you. How are you? Thanks for having us on. Of course. Thank you very much for you know agreeing to be on the show today. This is really an incredible episode. I'm sure it's, it's going to be really fun to hear from the two of you. This is technology and really a topic that I've been super passionate about for a long time. As a matter of fact, we're already starting to get questions from the live stream. Um, I see a question from Tassin. He's saying, uh, Tanmay, are you passionate about implementing tech in the field uh, of music or are you passionate about the field of music and singing? And I mean, I got to say, you know, for the longest time, as a matter of fact, actually me getting into machine learning was thanks to the world of language world of language you know watching Watson play Jeopardy was just so fascinating to me and and of course music and, and specifically the linguistics behind music right the, the the lyrics being able to understand the meaning of them being able to generate them computationally that's an area of you know uh, of interest for me so that's 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 where my passion lies and of course with the with, with the intersection of deep learning and now I'd love to hear about the work that you, Cliff and Alicia, are doing. So before we begin, I think it would be really interesting to sort of, you know, hear a little bit more about you two and what exactly it is that you're doing today. So how about we start with, with you, Cliff? Um, would you like to maybe quickly introduce yourself, let everybody know a little bit about who you are? Sure. Um, my name is Cliff Cooper, I'm CEO and founder of Online Music Sounds. Um, I have a background in music and education. Uh, I have... Um, uh, some music schools and language schools. Um, I'm very passionate about teaching. Um, and I've been in the music industry for quite some time, everything from retail uh, to delivery driver of pianos to um, a performer, singer, well, not singer, uh, a pianist. Um, and really getting into the qualification side was in the last 10 years, that's what I've been aiming at. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting to hear. Thank you very much for uh, for sharing. And, and Alicia, what about you? Would you like to maybe tell everybody a bit more about who you are? Yeah, sure. So I'm Alicia Lyons. Um, my history uh, or background is in mainly composing, performing. I've always done education teaching alongside that. Um, but hugely passionate, especially in the last five years, I'd say, um, where I've really become interested in not only the education side but technology um, and how that can help with music education um, also I, I well it goes back to my my dad actually being a builder and very much into inventing who who kind of spurred that on in, in me in terms of inventing and um, that's how I kind of met Cliff as well um, working on inventive products mm -hmm. um physical products um so i yeah i'm into to all sorts really to do with with music but i'd say in the last five years heavily in education 
Wow, that's very nice to hear. It's 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 also really nice actually to hear the story of how you and Cliff met because I mean I know that the, the way that we had met was actually pretty interesting and it was actually during a tech life skills episode uh, one time you know I I have my Apple Watch on and I got a LinkedIn notification um, and I was I was looking at it and I was like oh I got a LinkedIn message from Alicia and 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 you know you were mentioning about how you had seen the um, the the IBM Coursera course that I had that I had done on on AI machine learning. Um, and you had reached out to me and, you know, I was like, oh, I, I took a look at your profile. And I was like, oh, online R&D director uh, or R&D director at online music exams. And I was like, oh, I'm working on a project using technology in, in, in music. So why not discuss it with you? And so ever since then, we've been sort of, you know, working together and can't wait to see what we can do in the future as well. But speaking of your background, I also do know that you have uh, you you have you're, you're passionate about singing, and I also do happen to know you're very talented at it. Um, and I mean, as I mentioned, I have a neural network that can generate song lyrics, so I think it's only a natural fit that maybe we could spend a couple of seconds of today's episode actually hearing you sing a portion of the lyrics generated by the neural network, uh, which, by the way, everybody, that song will be available on my YouTube channel soon. Um, but, I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear it if, if, if you could please sing us a little, a little snippet of those lyrics. Okay. I just, uh, okay, let me just get them up. Okay. Okay, I've just received these. <laughs> Let me just read them. <laughs> no worries. Oh, I can't know the song. Take you there. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll have a go at the chorus. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. okay. I've just uh, got a little rhythm going. That you don't know how it feels to be alone. I'm gonna show you, yeah. I'm gonna take you there, take you there. Gonna take you there, take you there. I'm gonna take you there. I mean, I, <laughs> you're, you're, you're so talented. I mean, I. I <laughs> Thank you very much for, for, for doing that. I mean, it's so, it's so satisfying to me as, as a developer, you know, the guy who built the, the system that wrote the lyrics to actually see someone with, with, with your level of talent actually, you know, using those lyrics and, and being able to sing them and make a rhythm out of it. It's, it, it's incredibly satisfying. So thank you for that. <laughs> right. So I do know that, you know, sort of going back to the, to the work that the two of you do now, um, I, I do know that, of course, your your company, Online Music Exams, I mean, as, as the name suggests, is this sort of brand new way of being able to do music examinations and really music education online using the power of technology. And I want to know sort of what sparked that interest for you to actually bring education and technology together in this way. Because I know that recently, you know, we, we've sort of had to evolve the field of education at a much more rapid pace than we would have had to before, thanks to, you know, COVID and the pandemic and this, this whole thing. So my question is, what exactly sparked that interest for you? When did you get started and, and how did you get started? I mean, if either one of you want to take that up first. Oh, yeah. Um, well, um, for me personally, it was, um, I used to teach a lot as well when I was younger. I started teaching when I was about 18. Um, and I went into a charity project where I would teach students for free uh, mm -hmm. around different areas. Um, and there were so many students that were so talented that had no chance of paying for a lesson and definitely no chance of getting a qualification. Um, and so we started our own charity as well, Community Music Initiative, to do exactly that um, and to give more access just to the learning side of education. Um, and in, in fact, that was around the same time we had one of the music schools. So we would then encourage the students to come onto the school, into the school. Um, and at the end of the day, there's only so many places. Um, and there's only so many times available. Um, and there would be distance issues. So there would be parents as well who wouldn't be able to drop their, their kids off to the school. Um, and so that was the first problem, um, which you know, was upsetting in itself. Um, but then the second problem was when we got to the stage of student having the ability to take qualification, 
we would obviously have to pay for that as well. And when eventually it's like, at what point do you stop? You want to keep this going, but you've got to find another way. Mm -hmm. um, so it was about that point that we tried to think about online and, okay, let's start online teaching first. So we started online teaching um, and that was interesting. I, I don't know, when you're face to face with someone, as opposed to doing something online, it's very different. Um, especially if you're trying to teach a five-year-old how to play a specific notes, middle C on a piano, and there's 88 notes, and they're only black or white. So you've got to really explain yourself really well, mm -hmm. um, which was good because it taught us as teachers, you know, that there was some improvement to do in our delivery. Um, so I don't mean other teachers, I mean probably myself personally that I could improve. So, um, so from that, um, we then saw that it was working well and we could actually do something about the qualification side. Um, so we came up with a rough idea of how it could be done. This was in tech, this was a technology back in 2010. So, um, well, you know, that's well, my, 10 years have gone pretty quick. Um, and really that's when it started. We started trying to roll it out. Um, a lot of testing, um, a lot of resistance um, because quite understandably people want to do things face to face. Mm -hmm. um, but really it was our only option at the time to help more people than we had spaces for. Mm -hmm. And that's really how I got into it, I would say. And then would you say that one of your sort of major obstacles was actually sort of convincing people that, hey, you can do this sort of thing online, you don't need to be doing it face to face, and here's the infrastructure to actually do it? Absolutely. And it's people, one, because it's changed, and two, it wasn't convenient at the time. And I think convenience is still king today. Yeah. I mean, we, we actually covered that actually quite a bit in the, in the last episode of Tech Life Skills with Tanmay where, um, you know, we, we had two executives from the travel industry on and we were talking about how at the end of the day, it's all about the value or really the convenience that consumers get, right? What they choose to do or what offerings they choose to use. It's about the convenience, right? It could be that for some people, it happens to be way more convenient to just go to Google Flights because part of that convenience could be maybe it's cheaper. You don't need to pay a travel agent, right? But then for some people, you want that convenience of you just tell a travel agent, I want to be here on these dates at these times, figure it out. You know, what, what flights am I getting? You know, what are my hotel bookings looking like? Whatever. So convenience definitely is a big factor into that. And Lisa, I want to hear from you as well. You know, what sort of, uh, what, what sort of, what, what exactly does it, is it that you're passionate about, you know, when it comes to on the music, online music exams and what sort of inspired you to become part of that initiative? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I've always been known to my friends as the queen of Google, you know, really into researching, love learning. I've absolutely loved the explosion of online learning. Um, and I met Cliff when I went to teach at one of his music schools. And we realized that we had something in common, um, which was how to improve um, learning. So what it started with us discussing how to write a piano book um, that would help beginners, um, to then me pitching <laughs> one of my piano invention ideas uh, to Cliff because we just hit it off. Um, and, you know, the, the piano invention idea was to help improve the handshape of someone learning the piano. Mm -hmm. So we worked on that for quite a few years and did many prototypes and just really realized that we had a common um, interest, which was to, to help people learn better, to help people um, have access to education, to have access to qualifications. Um, to, to break down those barriers. So when Cliff was talking about online music exams, I was really excited um, to, to come on board because, you know, here you, you're combining the tech, you're combining, you know, working with online course providers, um, you know, you're, you're helping people as well. In my teaching experience, um, I used to get frustrated, and I'm sure many teachers do. Um, it's quite common, you get pupils really passionate about music, would then go and take a graded exam, be petrified of the, the experience, and then not want to, to continue with maybe the graded exams, um, to still learn, but not to have that structured path, because 
the, the graded experience that, you know, they found just frightening, and, you know, mm -hmm. especially little kids. Um, I, I did all my exams in that system, the, you know, the center-based, traditional face-to-face -face exams, but you do get a lot of students that do find it daunting, and it does unfortunately put a lot of people off. So um, I, I saw it as an opportunity to work on something positive that can provide a new route a new way, uh, not to to replace traditional centre-based exams, but mm -hmm. to help to offer an alternative. Um, so that coupled with obviously Mining Cliff's interest in tech and all things to do with whether it's AI, VR, you know, we're, we're genuinely passionate about that anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have many conversations um, about that as a, a subject in itself, but to combine that with music mm -hmm. and our desire to help, that's what's been really exciting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got to say, there's so many parallels that I'm seeing, right? Because we've done, I would say, one Tech Life Skills episode, you know, f focused on, centered around education before, um, as well as education sort of pops up as a topic in a lot of other episodes, too. So, for example, I had an episode with with, with Dr. Dr. Shafi from, from London, who, you know, Time Magazine calls him the, the world's most watched cancer surgeon, right? He actually live streams his, his, his surgeries um, in, in VR, so you can, you know, strap on a VR head set and join him um, and a lot of what he focuses on is actually teaching like the next generation of healthcare specialists using technology like virtual reality and I can you know already see and this is something I hadn't really thought about before but as you mentioned it you know things come to my mind around there's so much potential to teach music and actually being able to play music in for example technology like VR and AR and using AI there's so much exciting stuff that you could do there. Uh, as a matter of fact, before I sort of continue, I do want to go ahead and take up a question from the live stream. This one's from uh, from from Shiva on the live stream chat. Uh, she's asking, what is the revolution that you want to create using technology in traditional teaching of music in schools? Um, what, what are what are both of your perspectives? So so any thoughts on how you want to use technology to revolutionize teaching music in schools? Um. How I'd like to say it is what we do with online music exams is we partner with schools and exam boards and we enable the school itself and the teachers who are on the front line, by the way, um, they understand the demographic that they're teaching, um, to create their own courses, but get them accredited. So we're bringing the accreditation to the school themselves mm -hmm. and therefore it makes it relevant. Um, there's quality involved because it's government accredited quality um, and it's about reducing the barriers to that education, reducing the barriers to the, the delivery um, and what also happens then is the student doesn't have to uh, have the fear and the pressures of taking an exam uh, on a set day, uh, on a set window per year. I mean there's all sorts of things such as you get ill, um, you don't feel right, you, uh, things happen at home, you, you just don't know. So what we're able to do is uh, enable the student to take the exam on any day they want. And that can be even depicted by the teacher themselves. So it's, it's giving a bit more power to teachers and students directly. Mm -hmm. So being able to essentially, I mean, as, as you mentioned, make it so that teachers and students actually have more control over the process. Yes, and I'm not saying that anyone can just write their own course materials, their own books, and, and get it accredited. There's mm -hmm. obviously quality assurance in place uh, and, and protocol, but what we, what we can do is we're able to work directly with schools and teachers mm -hmm. and help them go, right, this is what needs to be done. It needs to fit like this, but you're free to teach and deliver it how you want. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you learn because of your teacher. Mm -hmm. Whether how well you learn is because of your teacher, mm -hmm. and your teacher is usually your teacher has to inspire you. And I'm excited when teachers ask these questions because it shows that they're really interested and they want to inspire and they want to do things for the kids. Um, and they're exactly exact the teachers that we want to talk to. 
Wow. So in a way, you know, people think about technology as this thing that is replacing humans at, at so many things. But in, the, in, in a way, what we're doing with this technology is we're putting humans further at the center of the process, right? We're enabling the teachers to really be, you know, in control and, and be the ones that, you know, obviously they're the ones doing the teaching. And so when they have that extra control, you know, that gives them the leeway, that gives them flexibility to do their job better. Right. So that's 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 basically what we're what we're doing here. I, I like that message, right? Putting humans further at the center, especially in such a creative field like like music, right? Like art. Uh, so now what I want to know is, of course, it's a pretty drastic change going from, you know, face to face, in person, getting things done physically to then transitioning to doing things online. So we've heard a little bit about the pros of this technique. What are some of the cons of the technique as well, right? What, what are the sort of pros and cons of it? And what are some of those challenges that you face today? So I would say the challenge still is the, the convenience of it. You said Alicia, I think the convenience is still maybe the main challenge. Um, and then it's the availability of the technology. Um, it's about inclusivity. Mm -hmm. Everyone needs to have easy access um, to the same systems, really, to enable to them um, to get the qualifications. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a restriction in the sense that at the moment it, it's on a computer, so we don't offer what we do, particularly on a phone. So we can't because. A sheet, piece of sheet music, you try to read a piece of sheet music on your phone while playing your instrument, scrolling through, um, it's not, you can't assure quality when you mm. do it like that. So there's the restriction there for sure. Um, I also think um, mindset is is a restriction. So, mm -hmm. and I know, Tammy, this is something that, that you talk about uh, machine learning and uh, people fear AI will replace humans. And I think there's still that battle there as soon as you say online with, with music, because people think, you know, music, it's so fundamental to humanity. It's so unique to us and to, to coin AI, anything to do with AI with music, you, you get that fear response in some people. Um, so it, it's changing that mindset really to to make it clear that it's it's an alternative, it's an alternative route, um, and the AI itself will never replace a, a real examiner. It just mm -hmm. guides the student, guides the student through the exam. Um, there is always a, a real live examiner to to mark to mark the performances. Mm -hmm. um, so I think mindset for me is something that I feel is a restriction. As soon as you say online, automated music exams, there's a motion that, oh, it's, n it's not as true to life as a face-to-face center-based exam. Mm -hmm. um, but when you, you know, when you press that record button, you're still gonna get the nerves, you still have that one, one chance to perform. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's a restriction, would you say, Cliff? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Is the mindset? It's mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you how do you how do you how do you ensure the mindset across so many different countries? You know, it's everyone's at different stages of technology as well and accessibility to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, what I like, though, is that fundamentally the challenges that you've shared aren't challenges of of you know at a fundamental level bringing something like music going from from face to face to to um to online but rather their challenges surrounding the infrastructure around that problem right so for example people not having access to technology or people having the wrong mindset about technology and what that tells me is that technology is capable of augmenting you know in in, in the way that you know we're, we're suggesting here um and that that in and of itself isn't the main challenge that we need to focus on right and sort of getting back to your point on mindset you know i i feel like in general when humans learn and when humans are you know, examined in a way, 
Automating it generally doesn't work, even with something that is traditionally viewed as statistical and as narrow as programming, right? Like there's websites like Leak Code or, or HackerRank or whatever, <clears throat> you know, whatever the, whatever the programmers are using these days. Um, and these, these websites, you know, they'll say, all right, here's a problem, build a Sudoku solver, um, write your code or, or whatever else, and click run, and if it passes all our test cases, you're good to go, otherwise you failed. Um, and these websites really don't work because then you overfit students to just being really good at solving problems the automated checker lets them through. And, and, and I feel like even within programming, that's a bit of a skewed assessment, but it's like, ah, it works, okay, fine, because we need some way to do it at scale. You know, there's millions of programmers, how are we going to test them all? I guess we got to do it this way. But then, especially in a field like music, you, know, you still need the humans there. Right? You're not going to be able to replace that human intelligence that's there to be able to analyze that creativity because it's fundamentally different every time. There might be patterns to pick up on you know, for, for a machine learning system, but there's no way to completely remove that human element of actually being able to comprehend, you know, this is a new kind of pattern that builds off of this meta pattern or whatever. So I, I feel like that's definitely something to, to, to keep in mind for everybody. And now I do want to transition to another question from the live stream, actually. This one's from uh, Sarah Shevlin on the uh, on a live stream. Hi, Sarah. Um, so Sarah's saying, <clears throat> the way music is consumed currently, for example, streaming platforms like Spotify, is quite disconnected and has lost the tangible qualities like records and CDs used to give to listeners. So in what ways do you think tech can be used or developed to enhance uh, the connection with artists and fans and also with learners of music and also people everywhere who love to listen to and engage with music? Really quickly, one thing I will say before I hand that off over to you, and you can think about that, um, is... You know, I, I'm, I'm relatively young. I mean, I when I started to get into the world of like programming, for example, when I was like, you know, or at least more intense programming when I was like 12, when I was like getting into machine learning and stuff. Um, back then, I used to use really, you know, modern developer tools like Docker, for example. And I would be like, how do developers live without this? How do developers live without the cloud? It doesn't make any sense to me. How can you get any work done without these new modern technologies? Um, th that's just what I've always had, so I kind of take it for granted. And similarly, you know, when I started, like, sort of, you know, doing research into this world of, uh, of music and stuff, and I started to realize, hey, we have these streaming services like, say, Apple Music or Spotify. It, it really, you know, it, it, I, when my friends told me that, you know, you can stream music today and you can just listen to pretty much whatever you want to. But a couple of years ago, you had to like go actually physically, you know, buy music. That, <laughs> I was taken aback for a second. I was like, what? <laughs> Why? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, it just didn't make sense to me. How could you have something like, you know, music not on a streaming platform and something that you have to go actually physically, you know, buy individual copies of? Um, and so that's, that's something that's, that's, you know, a foreign concept to me. And so I, I, I do want to hear what, uh, what, what your thoughts are on, on, on Sarah's question now. Um, well, I mean, yeah, I, I agree. The, the quality is different. If you go back to, you know, when we were going to H&B and buying CDs or before that and vinyl records. Um, but what I find interesting, actually, is platforms like YouTube or even social media. I feel touching on artists connecting with fans. I feel that artists are a lot more involved on social media, um, on performing on YouTube. If you look into the VR developments, I think VR with artists is gonna be the next real big thing to mm -hmm. have that connection with listeners so they can feel like they're there watching um, their favorite artists perform on stage. Um, I feel that in, in terms of that connection, it will be going more towards the the connection the, the the live connection you know with with social media platforms with vr um and maybe less away from just streaming on mm. on spotify but i think there would be that that need for that um personally i don't know how you feel cliff in terms of um, yeah i suppose i think there's always going to be the two sides i think you're going to have the music online the spotify but the, 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 you get a different feeling, obviously, when there's performance of music. Uh, you're relying, actually, on the energy that's in, in the room. I mean, 
uh, it, even the artists themselves feed off the energy of people in a room uh, or in a concert. Um, so it's a completely different experience. So again, I think they can live side by side. Um, is essentially what we're what we're saying. I think maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, something that 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 sort of stands out to me is that we've already seen examples of this in action and I do agree with you in the sense that this is going to scale up in the future um for example there's there's a game that I don't play myself but you know is 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 pretty popular Roblox um and and you know I, I'm forgetting who the artist was um but he had done he had partnered with the company behind Roblox to actually do like a virtual concert within the game so they actually you know had him put on like a it was it was one of those suits with a bunch of sensors on it where they could try track all of his body movements um, in, a, in a special room where he could, you know, actually, he could, he could as, as he would move, they'd be able to map that movement onto a virtual character in, 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 in the game, right? So, and, and that's just the beginning, right? Roblox is, you know, 2D little uh, game on your computer, right? But then imagine bringing that into virtual reality, which is something I'm sure people are already, are already starting to experiment with. And I think that's going to be huge in the future if we can't do things actually in person. I, I, I was wondering, what if we, you go to the, the, the farthest, further extents of that, where uh, if, if, say, if, uh, eventually VR gets to the point where you can put it inside your eye, and mm -hmm. then uh, and someone's born with virtual reality inside their eye, and they've got the suit on, I mean, what's to say that's any different from where, where we are now? Now, I know that's going to create a big divide uh, in opinion, mm -hmm. um, but it's, I think, you go look at what the end game could possibly be, but even if that was the case, as long as consciously you're feeling the conscious entities around you, then I think that's the most important thing. So long as you're not uh, separated from that. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. That that. that does make sense to me, but, you know, actually on this topic, as, as we've been talking, there's been a question from the live stream chat, and this is from uh, Anandi on the live stream chat, uh, as well as Tassin, actually, both. Um, Tassin's a slightly um, different topic, but I'll take both up at the same time. Uh, Anandi's saying, not performing in public, is this a pro or a con for artists, and uh, I assume for, for, um, for audiences as well. And Tassin's also asking, you know, what has the change been in the field of the music industry due to the pandemic? pandemic you know how, how did that make an impact so let's take up both of these right not performing in public is this a pro or a con and what's what's the change been in the music industry due to due to the pandemic uh, i for me i think it's a huge con not mm -hmm. performing in public um music's such a big part of you know life um and live performances as well is such a huge part of the music industry. So, you know, there's been a huge impact from the pandemic, huge. Um, so uh, it, it's sad. I know a lot of friends in, in the music industry and yes, they can go online and they can do performances, which is great. But as Cliff was saying before, it's for a performer and if you're in the audience, you're feeding off that energy exchange that is really important. Um, for the experience for both parties. So I, for me, I feel it's a con. However, what I do think is, is great, and I'm sure everyone's noticed this, is during the pandemic, um, the amount of amazing music videos that you'd see of people coming together. You know, do you remember in Italy when you had those scenes on the balconies and all, all sorts of amazing videos? It just goes to show that even when you know, that music, that live performance music is squashed. Mm -hmm. You can't squash that from humans because mm -hmm. they will just get together and find a way to perform live, whether it's performing their recorder on a balcony or singing, you know, across the street. Um, I, I think live performance, yes, it's been heavily disrupted, but it will always have a place, mm -hmm. you know, once the, the pandemic um, you know, times are, are over. Um, I, I don't think that will ever go away, no matter how much VR, AI, you know, however far technology goes, there is that want and need for that live interaction mm -hmm. from both musicians and audience members. 
right? Humans are humans are social animals, right? We 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 need that interaction, right? We need that face to face personal interaction. I gotta say, the pandemic has deprived a lot of us from a lot of that interaction. Uh, but you're right, people do find a way. Like right, life finds a way to 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 figure out how to socialize or how to you know get get their music fix. I mean, as as you mentioned with uh, with with this with the pandemic situation in, in Italy, which was incredibly unfortunate um, back when the pandemic had, had, had first hit. Um, you know, we we had all these all these people you know in the balconies and those those wonderful videos as, as you mentioned. Um, and so you know, it's 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 definitely interesting to to see how humans find a way and how we're going to continue. I mean, once the pandemic we start to see you know slowing down we start to see that situation slowing down how we sort of transition back into you know in-person events but also the impact that this will have had on having more virtual events as well so it's going to be that sort of mix of of of, of both now there's definitely been a shift in you know consumer behavior and and, and what they prefer but at the end of the day we're still humans <laughs> And so that's 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 definitely something to keep in mind. Now there is another question. This one's from the LinkedIn live stream. This one's from Ayush. Uh, he's asking, um, how do you differentiate recommendation systems and machine learning predictions? This one's not as related to the world of music. I will say that machine learning, really quickly, machine learning predictions can be used as the output for a recommender system, right? So you can use machine learning to power recommendation systems. Um, but because this question isn't incredibly related to today's episodes, uh, today's episode, please do feel free to leave that in the comments or so. I will uh, I will go ahead and get back to you um, after today's episode, or feel free to ask me in a in in, in another episode where we're talking about the world of machine learning. Uh, but actually, now that we talked about machine learning and, and recommender systems, I do want to ask the two of you. Uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the challenges that you face. Um, and, and now I want to know, what sort of bottlenecks do you have in your current process, in your current pipeline of, you know, the sort of online music exams, I guess, life cycle, you could call it, you know, that's the software developer and me coming back out here, um, is, you know, if, if you take a look at that life cycle, where are the bottlenecks in that process that you think can be improved or that you're already working towards improving using the power of, of technology, enabling you to do things further at scale, potentially even machine learning or AI technology? I'd say it's that access to internet speed mm -hmm. is definitely an issue. Uh, I, I mean, even in the UK, we're, we're not as set up, as well set up in terms of internet speed as they are in Singapore, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and we like to engage with 5G more, I would say, maybe in the future, uh, or even uh, with uh, Starlink, to see if there's an uh, ability to open up internet speeds to a wider audience. Um, I'd say also the, yeah, the introduction of the AI has been really helpful for us going, I suppose that's, that's, that's got through the bottleneck of language barriers, um, but in terms of what's next at the moment, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know which is that, uh, am, I, am I right? I think that's the, uh, it, it was just really internet speed, I would say. That's, that's really interesting to hear that, that the, 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 pro, the sort of main bottleneck that you that you face today does seem to be, you know, not even necessarily music related or education related, but rather technology infrastructure related, right? That's that's actually, you know, in, in a way inspiring to hear because that tells us that we can do so much with technology, but at the same time that we don't have the right infrastructure for everybody to use that technology, right? The people that can now have the ability to get this sort of examination done in so much more of an affordable way, accessible way, but then the people that often don't have this infrastructure are exactly the kind that need it the most, right? In in, 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 in a sense. Um, so that's definitely um, something that, that needs to be worked on. That's something we've talked about previously on Tech Life Skills from a more government perspective and, and sort of you know policy perspective as well. But then that also sort of brings me back to the question, if I sort of um, pivot this further and let me know if, if, if there's anything you have on mind right now or anything that you can actually share. Um, but you know, apart from like an accessibility perspective externally, you know, internally within the actual sort of online music exams, I guess, system or or the way that it works for people that actually do, um, do uh, access or, or, or sort of use the system, what are areas that you think could be could be done in more effective ways if the technology to do that existed? Um, 
good maybe question. that is a good question. Yeah, and I guess maybe the re- sort of main reason that I that I ask is because if you take a look, there's so many different pro, you know processes um, within different companies and, and sort of different pipelines where. When you identify a bottleneck, you can start to capture enough data to then be able to expand that bottleneck and make it so that's no longer what's causing, that's, make it so that that's no longer the weakest link in the chain, right? So, for example, you know, what Google's able to do with translation, right? Like, if you, if you Google something in a combination of, like, English and Spanish, they're still able to use neural networks to understand what all the words mean and what your sentence means, even though you're using, like, you're, you're code switching within a single search query. And a couple of years ago, you know, you would have had to think, uh, and I'm old enough to remember this at least, uh, you would have to think, you know, how do I word my sentence carefully? What keywords do I give Google to actually get it to return what I want? Uh, But now you can phrase things very, very flexibly in in a very flexible way. As a matter of fact, as I mentioned, even do code switching and Google is still able to give you the right results, right? So that's that's sort of what I'm uh, uh, alluding to in that sense. Um, there is also another uh, question really quickly that I do want to pivot to um, from from Vasav on on the LinkedIn chat uh, asking how can we implement musical knowledge into developing technology I feel like this is a bit more of an open-ended question I think that would require a bit more sort of detail to to really answer effectively Um, but one thing I will quickly say myself before I hand this over to you in case you have any thoughts um, is when developing technology to work within music, like, for example, the neural network that I built for automatically writing lyrics, I guess the main sort of thing to keep in mind is that within, especially machine learning, but technology in general, working with domain experts is very important, right? If I had just sat there as a developer trying to build the best, like, lyric writing bot, I would have gotten nowhere. Without actual feedback from songwriters, from people in music, that bot would not have been nearly as good as it is today. And even now, right? this is a tool to augment songwriters, help them. So I guess working with domain experts is really important. I mean, I see Vasav, you're a software development engineer, and so I'm not sure you know, how deep you are in the world of music, but if you're building technology in music, working with domain experts is important and sort of being able to, to, to collaborate them, with them is critical. But, you know, Cliff Elisa, any thoughts on how you can implement musical knowledge into actually developing technology? So I think there there is technology out there at the moment that, um, in fact, even Google has it, where it can identify the music. So it can tap into uh, publishing published songs and tell you what the song is. It's also um, technology that enables um, the I suppose the technology to read your pitch uh, and associate it with a piece of music. So if the music is digitalized, uh, it then will understand what pitch. When I say pitch, this is about your notes. So you know whether the note is higher or lower, um, and it will tell you when you've played a pitch incorrectly, and when you can do it, and it tell you about your rhythm as well. Um, that's extent to understand it's being used. Um, there's also the, the technology which mu- moves the music as well at the same time. So when you're playing, it knows when you're playing and it knows where you are in music and it can move with you, which is really helpful, especially for mobile uh, software. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's the limit to it. I, it, it in my opinion, it, it, it can only go so far because Music is an art form, and it's about your perception. So, for instance, I understand AI did a painting did it once in, uh, in New York, in a New York gallery. Um, it create, created its own art. And obviously, anyone can take away what they got from that piece of art. Mm-hmm. Uh, just like a human artist, you take away from it what you get from it. Um, but just because it can do it doesn't mean it can analyze someone else's art. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that there'll only be a certain amount that technology can do for music or creative industries. Um, that's where I'm at the moment, I think. Mm-hmm. Right, there, there is sort of that, that uh, I mean, f- first of all, if I, if I do take a step back, machine learning in general 
analyzing very creative data. For example, language, where things are up for interpretation, right? In general, I think that is very... It's a field that's very much in its infancy. And I know lots of people will be like, wait, what? Natural language processing in its infancy? We've been doing this for decades, right? We've got Google, we've got Siri, we've got all these chatbots, we've got so many great things. How could you say it's in its infancy? And I say that because natural language is infinitely more complex than any computer system can even remotely dream to achieve today. GPT-3 may very well be the edge of what we can do with NLP, and that's nowhere near even scratching the surface of how complex language really is, because language intrinsically ties into our thoughts and the way that we think and the way that our brains are structured and so much more. Society, right? all, all these things, that language is tied into everything. And so to understand language, you must understand everything else as well. Uh, but then, you know, music sort of in a very similar way, if anything, I think is a bit more complex because it is even further up for interpretation, right? As an artist, you have a, maybe potentially, you know, and this again varies from piece to piece, but maybe you have a specific message that you want to get across, maybe a story that you want to share. But then at the same time, people can take away what they want. I mean, as you mentioned, Cliff, what they want to take away from that piece of art, right? And so the complexity that comes in with using machine learning to understand something that complex and that much up for, you know, common sense reasoning is pretty practically something that, you know, we don't really have the technology to do today. I gotta say, as I was building my bot, you know, the main sort of challenge was not just building the network to write something, but also building another network to understand what had been written and what should be given to the songwriter, right? So that, that, that is definitely really um, a, a, a challenge that we gotta work towards solving in the future. As a matter of fact, we actually do have another comment. This one's again from Sarah, um, talking about a pro of having live music online, um, sort of going back to, to what we were talking about a little while ago, uh, is she says, I've experienced unexpected gem moments during this last year, engaging my favorite artists doing Instagram lives, music tutorials from their homes, and virtual concerts. So, you know, there's pros and cons to everything. And it's always possible that, you know, some, some things happen doing things virtually that, you know, couldn't have happened uh, physically or in a world without, you know, this, this pandemic situation. So, you know, there's a bright side to, 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 to everything. All right, there is another question that I do want to take up. This one's from Shiva uh, asking, what opportunities do you think will be available in the coming years in the field of music? So what, what sort of opportunities do you see? And also, what other skills uh, will they need more than um, just their knowledge in the world of music? So for musicians, what skills do they need apart from their knowledge in music? And what are some opportunities you see coming up in the next few years? You guys can ask. That's tough. <laughs> Still thinking. I think in them, there's going to be lots more virtual reality concerts happening mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be about conveying the energy from the band or the musician across that platform. Um, I think uh, that's probably as far as I can think just in, in this year, I mean there's probably, I mean, you probably know time, there's probably loads more opportunities and, and technologies coming out that can assist musicians. Um, I think it's, it's interesting, musicians actually are having to learn a new skill because they're having to learn how to use this technology and they're having to move with the times and they're also having to choose their type of technology, which platforms they use, um, do they use multi-platforms, um, do they venture into VR, how much do they spend, what hardware do they have, suddenly they, they have to understand you know, gra graphics cards and uh, if, should I get an Oculus Rift or should I get an you know, HTC or something like that? It's, it's a whole new world for, for musicians if you're not into tech already. Um, and that's going to be interesting. There, there's so many platforms, I think, buying for the same position, uh, which in one way is really good because it improves access. Um, but another way can perhaps create some segregation as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that I, I think there will be developments with AI music. So there's already all sorts of things going on. Bjork, for example, and, you know, she's, I don't know if you know much about um, Bjork with AI music, creating music with AI based on all her, her songs to do with the weather patterns, which is 
quite interesting. Um, there's all sorts of tools as well out there. Um, you know, that, that songwriters and composers, I feel, rather than being fearful, they may use as, you know, and we've talked about this before, um, Tame, with your songwriting tool, to, to augment their own creativity. So I think there will be a shift. And it's interesting, when I was younger, uh, before you'd have music notation programs like Sibelius and Finale, I would write, you know, with manuscript paper, with a pencil. And I remember when that movement happened, there was that, oh, you know, it's, you know, it's not real composing because you haven't got your pen. Um, <laughs> So in your paper and you're doing it on the computer and there was that you know that ugh, icky part where people had to transition through it whereas then the beauty of you know these notation programs where you can write a score and hear the orchestra play your composition then it's exciting I think there will be that shift with AI music where rather than the, the fear I think it, it may help composers augment their own creativity much like you know when you have a songwriter's rhyming dictionary mm -hmm. there, there will be more interesting and exciting tools that will will maybe take a, a composer on a a deeper journey or a new journey mm -hmm. so i think there will be be that for sure i also what i'm excited about um is the amount of courses um, that musicians will be able to do. And obviously that's exploded online <laughs> learning in this last decade. But what I find exciting is, is this, this almost movement to tailored learning, you know, especially with, with talks of quantum computing, with VR. I think for musicians, it, it's exciting, especially for learning, because now more than ever, you're going to find a course that you resonate with. You know, if you, if you maybe can't afford to have a, a teacher, a one-on-one -on -one lesson every week, there's going to be lots of exciting courses um, I think as well musicians and, and artists are becoming more involved in the education side um, creating courses um, so I think it's an exciting time for music and technology right so uh, I mean I, I like you know what the both of you mentioned because it sort of ties back into the fact that you know being uh, I guess technically I guess technology literate is the term that a lot of people use but I don't necessarily like that term I guess being tech savvy is is an advantage pretty much for everybody, but I guess especially for folks working with 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 music, right? And I mean, to to your point, how you know if you're not using your your pen and paper, it's it's not you're not really composing music. I guess you know I'm I'm not a software developer unless I'm using punch cards. So I mean, <laughs> we we have to evolve, right? We, we we really have to start to see what we can do next, thanks to new technology, right? Um, there was recently a video I was watching online, um, and unfortunately I'm forgetting who this is, but I'm sure YouTube will recommend it to, to, to everybody. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a video from an animator, and what he does is he makes you know, videos where he talks about different things, um, but instead of having him, it's an animated version of him. And the way that he records these videos is by taking you know, an actual video of him, and then taking a single sort of like key frame, drawing, drawing out the whole animation, and then feeding it into an AI-powered software that looks at all the other frames and automatically modifies his drawing to all the different frames. So you're not sitting there drawing every single frame for that animation. And he made a video tutorial talking about how to use this technology and you know the key point was that hey it's a good thing if animators can now use this technology it's not that it's not real animation it's animation made faster more easy so now you can focus on your content you can focus on fine-tuning the little details you can focus on so many more things more than just the mundane drawing out all the little changes in your lips lip syncing you know it, it it's just so much more convenient it, it's it's not that it's not real animation right so being able to be tech savvy understand how to communicate with technology uh to be able to make the right decisions for your audience for your fans for your music is is sort of what it what it boils down to and so now what i want to do is i want to sort of pivot a little bit um, and of course you know feel free to send in more questions um, on the live stream chat actually I see one more from from Sarah right now uh, Sarah's asking there are so many music courses online how can individual learners find ones that suit their needs best without feeling overwhelmed with so many choices 
The reason I love this question is because this is true in every industry. <laughs> There's so, so, like, actually, one of the things, you know, my, my, my friend asked me a little while ago, you know, you write books on, like, you know, the Julia programming language and, and Watson and Swift and so much. Why don't you write, like, a Python book? And, and my main sort of thing is, you search up Python books, there's millions of them. <laughs> so I, I don't just want to write another, you know, another piece of hay to go in the haystack, right? It's, 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 it's like, there's already so much. So now from your perspective, sort of tailoring to the field of music, how can individual learners find the courses that suit them best without being overwhelmed? I think one thing is standardization. So if you're looking for a specific level of education, there should be standardization. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I want to play to this level. I'm going to look for courses at that level and that should be easily accessible. And I suppose secondly is because it's so individual, it's really about the teacher who's teaching them. Uh, do you connect with that teacher? Um, I suppose, yeah, for me, those would be, it'd be those two. Mm. Alicia, what do you think? Yeah, I, I would say as well, it depends also why you're learning so for example if you're learning because you want that structured path and you want to get grades or maybe at a higher level you want to get those extra points that will maybe help you get into universities um then i i think you'd be looking for a certain course that's that's structured that you know that that has accreditation there's many music courses um that yes, it's down to the teacher, so what their background is. Um, but I think in terms of having a quality course, there is that one way to make sure it is accredited um, mm. if you're looking for a structured path. But then I agree with Cliff, if you're doing it, um, you know, you don't have that necessarily in mind. It's, it's about connecting with, with the, the teacher. Um, mm. But yeah, I agree that there are so many music courses. I love that. I mean, you know, if, if I were answering the same question for, for programming, I mean, uh, what I, I probably the first thing that came to my mind would not have been how do you connect with the guy teaching it. But that's actually what I like about your answers is that it sort of talks about how it's different in music than it is in other industries right? or, or in other fields. A major part of, you know, learning music, and I, you know, now that, now that I think about it, this applies to more fields than just music, of course. But something that we don't often think about is how well you actually connect with, for example, the person who's actually teaching the course, right? And I feel like that's exactly one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about, you know, myself teaching, like, for example, AI or, or machine learning to save, like, high school students, right? Because I feel like, if, if, they, if, they, if I can somehow make the examples more relatable to them, right, if I can somehow, you know, in, in a way, give them that resource um, and, and sort of allow them to have more fun doing it than they would otherwise, right, that could interest them to actually get into that field. And similarly, you know, if, if, if you happen to find a course uh, that's not only interesting to you, but you also sort of click or connect with the guy actually teaching the course or the, the person teaching that course, that I think is, is, is a major part of it, so... Thank you for bringing in the aspect of the human connection there. <laughs> All right, so now though, speaking of you know generalizing for music, I do want to pivot a little bit and understand a little bit more about what you've learned about education in general. Now I know that of course online music exams currently focuses on music, um, but my question is, do you have any plans right now? You know, to to, and I'm not sure if this is something you 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 can you can say just yet. You know, maybe there's there's an NDA that we signed or something. But um, you know, do do you, do you plan on diversifying from subjects outside of just music? Do you plan on sort of expanding in that sense? And also, what do you think you've actually learned from your experiences doing online music exams that you think the rest of the education industry in general should already be looking to apply? So, what are your thoughts? I, I feel that there's been a huge explosion with online learning, mm -hmm. but I feel the examination side is not as advanced. And that's an area that is exciting because, you know, as our previous um, question indicated that there's, there's just so many courses, it's a bit overwhelming. But in terms of the examination side, it's still rather traditional. So 
there's lots of exciting developments with online proctoring and, and all sorts of exciting things, but I, I still feel that there's room for development and improving and it's exciting. Um, I, I feel that with our company, yes, it's music is our passion. However, the actual technology of automated online exams is exciting to think of in, in other areas, in, in other subjects that process itself of, you know, why not allow more people to, to have less barriers in getting qualifications? So, you know, you've got less barriers in, in learning itself, but there's still that gap, I feel, with then actually going on to get that qualification because of where we're at with technology um, in examinations. So that there are online exams, um, but, you know, there's still maybe a lot of them where you have to still drive to a centre and then do your online exam with someone watching. Um, so I'm, I'm excited and interested in the development of examination, examinations itself. Um, there's, I feel there's going to be a big shift in tailored learning. And therefore, the questions I have is how is that going to affect the examination process? You know how how much have we have we changed examining someone itself in other subjects? I'm not talking about music, but actually, are we examining someone in a subject as best as we can? There's mm -hmm. all sorts of courses. You know, everyone learns in different ways. So I feel like we're really tackling that. You know, lots of people learn more visually. Mm -hmm. um, there's loads of really great video online courses. VR is going to be really great. Um, <laughs> but actually, then when you go to take the exam what's going on there mm -hmm. how great in the future for there maybe to to be vr exams you know mm -hmm. I, I think that's an area that is of interest to me anyway and and in terms of the future of online music exams and how that could branch into other subjects you know something that i think really proves the the, the value or, or really the wisdom of the folks on tech life skills like the guests that i bring on like like two of you for example is is how much what what what, what the guests say come up in the future even unintentionally in other episodes so for example a little while ago um mike tibbs uh who you know used to be a, a vp at a fortune one company uh he, he was he was on the show and he was talking about how digital transformation means nothing because you could be transforming but you're not necessarily transforming for the better right you need to be transforming by adding value using this new digital whatever that is right using technology and so similarly, exactly what you mentioned, Alicia, if the exam is technically online, but you still need to go somewhere in person and be proctored in person, that's basically no better than just doing it on a piece of paper, right? I mean, you know, it's, you're not really adding all that much value by transforming to do things in, in a digital way. And so I, I feel like that's, a, that's like an interesting sort of tie-in in the sense that we need to see how we can not only transform digitally, but add value doing so, right? So many teachers, for example, you know, have put in so much extra effort, and I, I've actually seen this with some of my friends, um, during, you know, online classes and, and COVID, they've gotten like light board setups and all these really interesting things to try and make online learning as engaging as possible. But then there's also the other sort of group of, of for example, teachers that not necessarily on purpose, but maybe just don't have the technical knowledge to actually make online learning as engaging or as fun as it should be, right? And so that sort of opens up the whole other question of how can we build the right infrastructure to enable not just online learning, but online learning that is better than what we could be doing physically. And I guess that that's sort of what, what opens up the entire uh, field to, to, to what we're doing in the future, right? That, I guess that's, that's, that's where we're evolving. Uh, now, there is one more uh, question that I do want to take up really quickly from Cecily. Uh, Cecily is asking, what was one of the most powerful developments in the music field using technology? So throughout your careers, what's one of the most important developments you've seen using technology? I mean, apart from online music exams. <laughs> apart from that one. Really good question. Yeah. It's the sort of thing that's sort of hard to say off the top yeah, of your head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you can think about that because, you know, I, I, I got to say, if you would ask me, you know, what's the most important thing that's been done in AI, you know, in the past 40 years, way longer than I've been alive, you know, it, it, it would take me 
some time to really think, you know, what, what really is that, that sort of milestone that we reached in, in AI? It could be compute power, it could be big data, it could be, you know, back propagation, the different optimizers, it could be the transformer architecture, you know, it's, it's so much stuff. So from your perspective in music, what do you think is the most, one of the first things that comes to your mind? I think for me, it's the reduction in costs for musicians to be able to produce and record music themselves at home. I like that. Was I like it, that a lot. It was, I, and don't get me wrong, I love real to real recording um, and the analog sound, but which can be replicated to an extent, but it's the digitalization of this and how it was able able to reach a wider audience at reduced cost. I think that empowered so many people. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's interesting you said that, Cliff, because the first thing that came to my mind was Logic, using, you know, GarageBand yeah. Logic. I remember when I first got that and just being so excited, just, you know, that, that, that massively changed my life. Um, obviously, before that, there was the music notation software, which is a composer, that was really great, but, but yeah. The, the logic and exactly what Cliff said, I think massively changed my life. Accessibility so, yeah. really changes the way that a lot of us think about technology. Uh, cloud technology, for example, acts as like an infrastructure, right? Where now we have so many people that can just sit down one day and be like, I want this to exist. And they can spin up a cloud server, they can train an AI model, they can do it all themselves. Kind of like how, like, within astronomy, if you wanted to observe Jupiter and its moons, right, you could buy a telescope and you could do it, right? Even though it would be expensive, it would be possible, right? It's, it's not completely limited to just a scientific community with multi-tens of millions of dollars worth of telescopes and things they put in the sky, right? Similarly, with cloud technology, AI and other sort of advanced technologies became accessible to people and developers. And now with music, right, technologies like Logic Pro X from Apple, or, you know, and there's so many more that, you know, I, I don't know off the top of my head, of course, I'm not the musician, right? But, but, you know, all this different software is now enabling musicians to start to create at scale. Right? It doesn't matter if you're not a professional, it doesn't matter if you ha don't have like a multi-million dollar studio set up, you can still create music. You can find people that have the same taste as you. You can find the people that want to hear your message or your story. And that's something that you can't get without the accessibility that technology affords you. So I think that is, uh, that, is, that is definitely a really important aspect to focus on. As a matter of fact, it ties right back into um, this, this neural network that I built. You know, I've, I've been working with a very good friend of mine, his name is James Haybear, um, to actually produce some music uh, with, with vocals from a couple of artists, um, from, 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 from actually singing lyrics from the neural network. And if it weren't for, you know, these applications like Logic, for example, he wouldn't have been able to go ahead and, and, and produce his music, right? It's plain and simple as that. It would require a lot more money and time, which would have been too big of a barrier of entry, right? And so this sort of technology making it more accessible, I think, is really, really important to getting so many different messages out there, especially at the scale that we live today. And so that's... Um, that's, that's, that's definitely important. All right, so now one more question. <laughs> this one's from Shiva. Uh, Shiva's asking, uh, before the live stream ends, uh, Tanmay, would you ever sing or even try to play any instruments other than mayonnaise? You know, you might've seen the promo and I'm not sure if any of you picked up on the reference, but you know, the, the reference to SpongeBob with, with Patrick talking about mayonnaise being an instrument. <laughs> So that's that, that's that's where the promo video comes from. Um, but uh, Shiva's also asking, do you believe that music has healing power? Curious to know from you. So uh, the first thing is, I mean, to, to answer your question personally, I don't know about singing. That's that's not my. Um, that's that's definitely not what uh, was in my comfort zone. I can, I can. <laughs> I can write code really well, but I'm not sure about singing. So, um, uh, but apart from that, though, you know, building this neural network and and, and sort of um, diving deeper into the world of music because of it um, has definitely shown me a lot of things um, that you know I, I, I at first you know didn't didn't realize I was interested in. Right. So, um, 
you know, all the way from the raw linguistics perspective of it to the actual music element of it. You know, there's so much more that I've been able to discover. I will be uploading that to my uh, YouTube channel very soon, the song that we produced uh, from the Neural Network. It was sung by an amazing singer. Her name's Elena Coates, um, and also composed uh, by, as I mentioned, James, as well as another one with, uh, again, very talented singer, uh, Claudia Heuser, too. So I will be putting links to those very soon. And I'm going to be working a lot with music in the future as well. So do stay tuned for that. And while I might not be the one singing, rest assured, at some part in the pipeline, my software will be playing a role. So <laughs> we can, I, I, can, I can assure you of that much at least. <laughs> So thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, thank you very much, Shiva, for your question. Uh, also, you know, another comment from uh, Sarah that I think is really interesting, talking about how so many school examinations were stopped completely in 2020 because of the pandemic. So the need for reliable, secure, and accessible online examinations has become very evident. Completely agreed. You know, we see um, one of my friends in, in, in university talking about how Right after the pandemic and, and due to the online exams, everyone's grades have skyrocketed. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's something that we need to fix, you know. Keep, keep the grades up, but actually make it because they have learned something. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's, that's something we do need to fix for sure. That's, that's, a, good con that's a good point, Sarah. Uh, and you know who knows maybe online music exams is going to be that, uh, that, that platform that, 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 that brings out this innovation. So, so thank you very much, Sarah, for that. Um, there is another quick question. Um, this one is from Cubing, or, or, or yeah, Cubing with Renuka, asking what's the best language for web development? You don't really have much of a say with web development. I mean, JavaScript is kind of your only real option on the web browser today. Uh, but again, not entirely related to today's episode, so feel free to comment and I'll get back to you in more detail. Uh, apart from that, that brings us to an end from the live stream questions. However, before we end our discussion today, of course, I do want to know from, from your experiences and from, from what you've seen asked today from the, from the live stream chat from our audience, what would you like to leave them with today? What is a message that you want to share with them? So maybe, you know, Cliff, Alicia, we can start with either one of you. Who wants to go first? If you can go first. <laughs> sure. Shows that technology, I think, is essential uh, for the accessibility of all the creative arts, uh, especially seeing as the direction us humans are going in. Um, I would ask any musician, teacher, school, examination board who who wants help in music, who, to embrace technology, knowing that it doesn't need to replace humans at all. It can be utilized to bring accessibility and affordability. Um, and, that, and we're in, you know, we on the music terms are open to anyone who wants that, as we're all about bringing accessibility to students. Um, and so, yeah, that's what would be my message. Thank you very much for sharing. And Alicia, of course, I'd love to hear from you um, too. Okay, uh, I would say that technology developments in technology, AI technology are huge topics of this century. But I would say with, with music, one of the things we're, we're trying to support and encourage um, is that, that music is, in terms of humanity, I feel that music brings those communication skills, teamwork skills, um, creative thinking skills. Um, it develops those, which I feel is, is really going to be huge for the way we're going in AI technology. So um, I, yeah, I would encourage schools, um, online courses to, to really get behind that side of you know the the music education and increasing access to qualifications to encourage that part of humanity which i feel is so important in the the direction we're going it's not really a, a takeaway statement my takeaway statement was it would be go and discover 
you know, your, your music selves, use technology to, to discover that relationship, like we've talked about with all these amazing technology advancements. It's exciting to develop further the possibilities of music in everyone. That is amazing. That's a great statement, I guess. <laughs> Love it. They're using technology to discover, not to replace, but to help you discover your music self. I mean, I, I got to say, I mean, even as I was developing this neural network, for example, without the power of machine learning, just to even help me find, you know, the right ground truth data to be testing upon, right? I mean, without the sort of music recommendation algorithms within like Apple Music and Spotify, right? I mean, that's making music more accessible to everybody. It's helping people discover more of the stuff that they like and the stuff that they want to listen to, right? So using technology to find out more about yourself, the music that you want to listen to, the music that you want to create, I think that is definitely very important. So understanding that aspect of, of where technology lies in your life is, is, is critical. And so thank you very much, Alicia. Thank you, Cliff, for being on the show today. This was incredibly fun. Um, one really quick thing I do want to say, question from Anandi in the live stream chat asking any tips for learning neural networks. Well, you can go ahead and take a look at my Learn Deep Learning from Scratch series on YouTube, which I will link to in the description or actually in the live stream chat after we end today. So thank you very much for asking that question as well. So this is a really fun episode. I've got, I've really garnered a lot of insight here today, right? All the way from, you know, the ways technology is really enabling us to have better education to some of the main challenges that we're facing actually applying technology in education, which as it so happens, isn't really about the education, but rather about the access to technology, which is something that we really need to dive deeper into in a future Tech Life Skills episode as well. So thank you very much for bringing that up. And of course, also how at the end of the day, we're not replacing humans with this technology, but rather we're putting them further at the center of something that is fundamentally so human and creativity driven. So once again, Really interesting episode. Thank you very much, Alicia. Thank you very much, Cliff. Make sure you join us next week, everybody, at 11 a.m. Eastern time next Sunday. We've got some really fun stuff coming up about the world of data and AI. So thank you very much once again, everybody. I'm looking forward to seeing you next week, and goodbye. <laughs>